The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. Austin McCormick here with my co-host Jimmy Johnson, and today we have the privilege to speak with Dr. John English Lee. So welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And the topic for our conversation today is going to be Robert Haldane and the Sabbath. Uh, I know that this is a topic that you're interested in, but before uh, we start getting into this topic, you are a first-time interviewee to our show. It is a privilege to finally get to have you on. Can you just uh, begin our conversation by telling our audience a little bit about yourself, perhaps uh, whatever you want to include in that, maybe uh, how you became a follower of Christ, where you're serving at now, and um, we're, we're 1689 here. Uh, I don't, we'll let you speak to your confessional affirmation, but can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I am, um, my name is John English Lee, and just because someone will be confused by that name, uh, John English is a double name, and my father's name was John, and my grandfather's first name is English, and they put them together for me, so I'm John English. Um, and I, uh, I came to know the Lord as a relatively young man. I was in uh, fourth grade, I think, um, and uh, came to faith and was baptized, and then didn't have a lot of um, good churches. We moved around a lot and never really plugged into many good churches, and it wasn't until college that I really was able to plug into a church that doctrinally um, was robust and, and really was able to, uh, interested in answering the questions that I had. And so it was in college that I really grew in my faith and uh, particularly uh, the reformed expression of the Christian faith and came to baptistic convictions out of that. And then um, I was doing some ministry here in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where I live. And um, the Lord called me out of that to go to seminary and I uh, was able to do an MDiv and then a PhD at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville and I uh, studied systematic and historical theology. And I was able to write a dissertation on the Sabbath, uh, specifically looking at the question of is weekly Sabbath rest a creation ordinance? So that's kind of a, a, a crucial hinge point of the whole Sabbath debate. And so I wanted to zero in on that question. And I was able to study uh, the Sabbath from um, exegetically, theologically, and a lot of church history, historical theology. And, um, and so that's really become something. I wasn't setting out to become the Sabbath guy, but because I was um, blessed or forced, depending on your perspective, to read a lot of, of the, on the Sabbath, um, kind of become that guy. Um, I'm married uh, to my wife of uh, 12, it'll be 12 years this year. Her name's Rebecca. We have three sons and another child on the way. Um, I serve currently as a pastor of discipleship at Morning View Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Our church, um, our church's primary confession is the 1689, and I, I fully subscribe to that. Um, yeah, interests, I love to read. Um, and I, I used to be a scuba diving instructor as a younger man. So that's something that most people wouldn't know by looking at me. Um, I don't get to do as much now as I used to, but I, I do enjoy it. So there's a little bit about me. Well, thank you for sharing that with us as, as well as our audience. Recently, uh, Reformation Heritage Books republished or published a book titled Sanctification of the Sabbath, the Permanent Obligation of the Sabbath or the Lord's Day by Robert Haldane. And you wrote the preface for the book. What, what other responsibilities did you have in bringing about this publication? Yeah, Haldane's work on the Sabbath, um, out of all of the things that I read, in researching for my dissertation on the Sabbath, his one work was the single most helpful thing that I read on the Sabbath. Um, I discovered it uh, in a passing footnote that somebody had, had remarked about it. And when I chased down that footnote, um, I really was helped more, especially his arguments about 
um, the transfer of the day from Saturday to Sunday and the perpetuity of the Sabbath commandment underneath the new covenant. He was exceptionally helpful on, on those two questions. And so having come out of the dissertation and discovered this work, I said, we need to republish this. It hasn't been published as a standalone document or treatise that I could discover uh, for a long time. It was originally published somewhere around the 1850s as an appendix to his larger commentary on the book of Romans, which most people are familiar with out of the Geneva commentary series from Banner of Truth. Excellent commentary on Romans. Originally published as a three volume set, and this was an appendix that he wrote. It's quite an, you know, it's almost like a John Owen type appendix. Very, very long. Um, but it is, it, we pulled it out and we, we, we modernized the language. I did it with the help of a, a friend of mine named Cody Float. He and I went through and modernized the language um, and kind of formatted it a little bit. And I proposed it to Joel Beakey. I said, hey, can we, can we republish this? It's really helpful. And he loved the idea. And so um, we got it reformatted. And then they asked me to write a um, biographical and theological introduction to this work. Where, where did it come from? Who is this Haldane guy? Why is it important today? And so I wrote that. I did, did some research, and I wrote uh, a pretty lengthy preface, um, much of which they decided to chop out. Um, but I'm going to have that part that we chopped out. I'm going to have it published, Lord willing, out of the uh, Journal for the Institute of Reformed Baptist Studies, JIRBS, with Richard Barcellus. Um, hopefully it will be coming out this year in their journal. Um, so I wrote the biographical and theological introduction to Haldane's text and tried to leave Haldane's text alone as much as we could, only modernizing punctuation and a few words, maybe footnoting a few words that are strange to us today. So that's what I did for this republication. Well, you mentioned in that last answer that one of the questions that you were uh, asked was, who was this guy? Or at least you had that question as you were thinking about writing the preface. And so we want to ask you, who is this guy? Uh, yeah. Can you tell our audience a little bit about who Robert Haldane was? Yeah, I, I knew very, very little about Haldane when I started studying his theological works. And when I read his story, I was deeply encouraged. Uh, Haldane was born in 1764, and he was the son of a noble family in Scotland. Um, he joined the Navy, and when he came back from uh, some, some time in the Navy, he got married and eventually settled down to what he thought would be a life of nobility there in England. And this was right about the time of the, the French Revolution happening. He was kind of interested in new ideas, especially ideas that would bring about uh, equality for man and things like that. And right about that time, his brother James came to know the Lord. And between James's conversion and a, a pastor there named David Bogue, um, Haldane eventually came to know the Lord in 1795. Um, Haldane then, with great zeal, um, tried to serve the kingdom of God. And he, he put a bunch of his money, he sold things, he sold land and, and houses and, and put a bunch of money into printing tracts and printing Bibles and sending them overseas. And he would be uh, an open-air preacher. He himself would go out. In fact, it said that he he preached so often and so vigorously that he would have to stop and basically go on bed rest so that his throat could heal. Um, he eventually was going to go on a just a, a month or two long trip to the continent. Um, and while he was in Paris, he was persuaded to go visit Geneva. And when he got to Geneva, um, what he discovered was pretty disappointing. It was not the Geneva um, that John Calvin had left. It was not the Geneva full of Reformed theology. It was the Geneva that had been overtaken um, by, by liberal theology. And um, the story goes that he got there and he was supposed to go on this tour of a mountain there. And the old man that was supposed to take him got sick. And so this young student came and volunteered to be his tour guide, and the student was a student of the Divinity School there, and throughout the course of the day, Haldane was kind of 
asking the, the student questions and the question was peppering Haldane with answers such that the the student was kind of fixed. He, he was he was stuck on this man named Robert Haldane. And so the next day, the student came back to visit Haldane. And the next day he came back and he brought fellow students with him. And they, they kept coming and kept coming. And, and, and as the story goes, there was a long table in the house in which Haldane was staying. And there would be a dozen or more students that would be surrounding this table each night, late into the night, with Bibles in English and in French and in Latin and in Hebrew and in Greek. And they would spend the evening debating a, a theology. And these students had never heard anybody talk about the Bible and about doctrine like Haldane was doing. They were raised in very humanistic seminaries. They hadn't heard somebody talk about the doctrine of sin and talk about the law of God and its perpetuity. In fact, there was um, one of the young men, um, Merle de Avignon, who wrote a, um, a well-known, now Banner publishes it in two volumes, History of the Reformation, uh, he was one of the men that would be sitting around the table, and, and he finally remarked to Haldane one night, he said, I, I can now see your doctrine of sin in the Bible. And Haldane responded, well, yes, my good man, but do you see it in your own heart? And he later recounted how piercing that question was and how it, God used it to lead to his own conversion. Um, and while Haldane was in Geneva, the chair of the School of Theology there, uh, became very agitated by this theology that his students were learning from Haldane. And he, he tried to run Haldane out of town. He tried to get it to where the students couldn't go preach in the pulpits anymore because they didn't want this theology, this Reformation theology, to leak out. Um, it was kind of similar to, Haldane's experience was kind of similar to Calvin, who, you know, approximately 300 years before had meant to pass through Geneva, but somebody had told him, no, you need to, you need to stay here. You need to work. God's going to work through you. And God eventually did that for him. Um, Haldane eventually went back home to Scotland. He had a very prolific writing ministry. He wrote a, several things on uh, the inspiration and authority of Scripture wrote against the Apocrypha. He wrote several things against the Sabbath. Uh, he, he lectured and taught and eventually published his um, commentary on Romans, which has been, I don't know how many copies of that are around, many, many of them. Um, and so he was, he was a stalwart defender of warm evangelical Calvinism. And, and he was a godly man that, that, that I felt very much a kindred spirit with as I studied him. So I, I was excited to learn more about him. Well, now that we have a better idea of who the man was that, that wrote this work that you helped bring to republication for modern readers, let's dive into some of the arguments that he makes for the Christian Sabbath. And as you know very well, whole books and dissertations can be written on the subject of the Christian Sabbath. But we're just going to focus in on a, a few of his, his various arguments or a few of the things that he brings up in the book. So first, what is Haldane's argument for the Sabbath being under both the Old and New Covenant? Yeah, he makes several points uh, which are overlapping. Um, the first is that he sees it built into creation in Genesis 2. And God rested on the seventh day. It was a day that was blessed, just like man was, just like marriage. And it's something that we, because of this blessing, ought to consider it for perpetual observance. Similarly, that, that interpretation is confirmed because the Sabbath and its observance predated the giving of the law at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. If you read Exodus 16, where uh, Moses is talking to Israel about the gathering of manna. They were supposed to gather enough on six days and not gather any on the seventh day because the seventh day is a Sabbath to be kept holy. There's, there's no explanation there. It's, it's assumed knowledge that Israel in Exodus 16, prior to the giving of the law, would understand what the Sabbath was. There's no, there's no debate. There's no question. Um, he sees the perpetuity of the moral law of God. As, as another reason why we um, still believe the Sabbath to be binding under the Old and the New 
covenant. That the observation of it is different, but the moral command remains nonetheless. And it's that same moral law which is written on the heart of man that's given in the new covenant when the fullness of the Holy Spirit um, presses the law of God into the hearts of his people. And that continues the, the, um, the pattern for us today. Well, you mentioned at the beginning of the show that you've kind of become known as the Sabbath guy. So I anticipate that you are very aware of many of the uh, objections that there are to the fourth commandment uh, being uh, now morally binding. But uh, what objections does Hal Dane anticipate to his view that the Sabbath is now morally binding? And how does he respond? Yeah, he he anticipates many of the same objections that were given before him and many of the same objections that are given today, Uh, one of which was the supposed non-observance of the Sabbath by the patriarchs. That is, there's there's no, according to the argument, there's no explicit reference to the Sabbath being observed from Genesis 2 until Exodus um, Exodus 20 or Exodus 16, I guess. However, he, he, he cuts that off and says, well, that, that's, first of all, it's an argument from silence. It makes assumptions that just because it's not explicitly mentioned, therefore they're not observing it. That's an assumption that's not borne out in the text. Further, we, we see the creation ordinance of marriage quickly thrown out by mankind in favor of polygamy. And if the If the depravity of man related to marriage is so quickly lost, then it shouldn't shock us that that mankind would reject weekly Sabbath keeping, that creation ordinance prior to the giving of the law. Um, Further, in Exodus 16, like I mentioned before, it assumes knowledge about Sabbath keeping even prior to the giving of the law. Um, and, And he argues similarly that that Sabbath observance is not merely ceremonial. Some like to say that, well, nine of the Ten Commandments are binding because those are moral, but the Fourth Commandment, that's different. That one was ceremonial, and therefore it can be, uh, it's been abrogated in the New Covenant. And uh, he, he argues that by saying, no, no, no. Let's look at how the moral law is different from the ceremonial and civil law. He says, what, which of the laws were written by the finger of God himself. That would be the moral law. Which of the laws were written on stone? That would be the moral law. Which of the laws were placed in the Ark of the Covenant? That would be the moral law. And so there's a, there's a very clear distinction between the ten words, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and the, the judgments or the, the things that flow out or downstream of the moral law. Um, and then he, he goes to the New Covenant, too, the New Testament. He says, when Jesus is asked questions about the Sabbath, where does Jesus go? He doesn't go to Exodus 20. He doesn't go to Exodus uh, 16. When Jesus is asked about the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2, for example, he goes back to Genesis 2. And he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man being made for the Sabbath. And so he he argues that even Jesus sees that there is a Sabbath principle that predates the Mosaic law, that predates the giving of the law in Exodus 20, that goes all the way back to the way that God has written into creation, into the very fabric of creation, this rhythm of six and one that is for man's good and for God's glory from the very beginning. One of the areas I believe that you said was most helpful from this work for you personally was where he talked about the change of days from from saturday to sunday so what is the or what does he teach us about these things in particular the switching of the days yeah how dane um he helpfully or it's helpful to me uh, he doesn't merely go to the couple of places in the New Testament that mention the Lord's Day, like Revelation 1.10. Um, he doesn't merely go to Acts 20, verse 7, I believe, when they were gathering together each week. Uh, he, he starts looking at the Old Testament, and he says the Old Testament itself points to 
a, uh, it foreshadows something greater. It's pointing to something. And so if we read our Old Testament correctly, we would have assumed that some change is coming, that, that this, this Sabbath theology is building and it's escalating towards something greater. So, for example, he says, look at Exodus 20, the giving of the fourth commandment. And that fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy because on that day the Lord himself rested. And so it points back to creation. But when you go read Deuteronomy and you look at the fourth commandment there, it's not exactly the same. It says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy because the Lord redeemed you out of bondage in Egypt. And so Exodus is pointing backwards to creation. Deuteronomy is pointing not merely to creation, but to redemption, to, we could say, the creation of the people of God out of this pagan land. And, it's, and this multiplicity of motivations for keeping the fourth commandment is foreshadowing something greater. Similarly, he argues that the changing of the day, um, or that for the... Um, the Old Testament anticipating this change of day, he looks at typology. And this is one of his um, more unique looks at it, uh, more unique contributions to Sabbath theology. He talks about, for example, uh, the language of eighth day. What, what does that have to do in the text? So if you read your Bibles, you see that boys were circumcised on the eighth day. Well, what's the significance of that? Priests were uh, anointed on the eighth day well what if it were seventh we'd see significance in that maybe going back to completion or going back to the the culmination of the creative week um, but eighth doesn't seem to have any significance when he argues that all of these eighth day languages this eighth day theology was pointing forward pressing us forward to an eighth day to come which would be the resurrection of christ which he says is the eighth day, or counting from the old creation, the first day of a new creation week. So in the resurrection with, of Christ, who is our first fruits of the resurrection, the New Testament, we have start off the, the inauguration of a new age, a new creative work that's being done. And so all of these types, he argues, point forward. He does a better job than I'm doing right now. But he, they, he argues that they build and they point forward to this resurrection day. They're anticipating a new day. And that day, that day of change is fitting. He says the, the, in the Old Covenant, they worked and worked and worked and worked, and they looked forward to Saturday. Each week, they work and work and work and work, and they're always looking forward to something. They're looking forward. Well, in the New Covenant, the thing to which the people of God have been looking that resurrection day, that, that, that new creation has come in Christ's resurrection on the Lord's day, on that Easter morning. And from that position of the work being done and this new creation begun, we start our week from a position of rest on Sunday and we then go out from that rest. We don't have to look forward to something greater to come. The great thing has happened. And from that position, that sure work of Christ. Christ's work being done and being accepted, we then march out from the Lord's day, going into the world, doing the Lord's work. And so he argues that there's typological significance pointing to this change of day. There's, there's different motivations for the Lord's day uh, or for the Sabbath in the Old Covenant pointing to something greater than merely looking backwards. Um, and Christ's resurrection itself is kind of the final confirmation of his typological interpretation of sabbath theology hmm. well like we mentioned we said that much more could be said about this doctrine and we believe that you have said much about this in other places and so perhaps we could link to uh, some of those places in our show notes but uh, for our audience where else have you written or spoken about the sabbath yeah, I have a website, um, johnenglishlee.com, that has a long series of blog posts that I looked at the biblical, theological, historical uh, in, in analysis of the Sabbath, the doctrine of the Sabbath, um, and 
particularly looking at the transfer of day. Uh, a lot of people have found that helpful. That seems to be something that really trips people up when they start studying the Sabbath. And so I would look there. There's also links there to journal articles. I've written four or five journal articles for a more scholarly look uh, at the historical interpretations of the doctrine of Sabbath and things like that. Um, I've taught a class at uh, CBTS, Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, on the doctrine of the law and the Sabbath. And so um, that's been helpful to people. You can look there. And I'm, I'm toying with the idea of, of writing a book on the Sabbath. Um, people have been asking me to do that. So I may do that if I can gather all my thoughts and make it something helpful. So um, that's where I'd go to look. I've also, there's some stuff on Founders Ministries website as well. There's some things there that can be helpful as well. Well, speaking of gathering your thoughts, do you have any final thoughts or encouragements pertaining to Robert Haldane or, or the Sabbath in particular for our listeners as we think about this and as we attempt to obey the Sabbath command as Christians now? Yeah, I, I was really encouraged looking at Haldane's biography, at his personal history. Haldane was not a trained scholar. He, he didn't go to seminary. Um, he was saved later in life than, than many people. Um, he was in many ways just a man, but he was a man who was steeped in scripture and a man who sought to be faithful to what was in front of him. He was a man who spoke with, with great conviction, great courage, before other scholars and other leaders, people that knew a lot more theology than him, he was unafraid to stand before them and contradict them because he knew what the Bible said. And God used him mightily. And, and I want to encourage our, our listeners that, you know, seminary degree does not make one right. Um, that simple faith in the Bible and confidence in God's Word is enough to be used mightily by God for great things in His kingdom. So, um, press into God's word and trust that it is our sure refuge and strength. Amen. And we have been talking with John English Lee about Robert Haldane and the Christian Sabbath. Thank you again, John English, for coming on and talking with us in this episode. Yeah, thanks for having me. And to our listeners, we wish you grace and peace. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.